to the City Club Forum. I'm Kenneth Kovach, Vice President of the City Club. South Africa, today and tomorrow, is the topic of our forum. Our speaker is the distinguished editor of the Johannesburg Post, Percy Koboza. Mr. Koboza is now serving as editor-in-residence of the Washington Star. He has written for newspapers and journals all over the world, including the London Times, the New York Times, and the Washington Post. Mr. Koboza's journalistic career began in 1963 as a cub reporter with the world in Johannesburg. In 1974, after successive promotions, he was named editor of the world. The world, though, was banned by the government of South Africa in 1977, and Mr. Koboza was imprisoned for almost six months. Upon his release, he assumed editorship of The Post, a daily newspaper published for blacks. In effect, it is a replacement for the banned world. The Post is the largest and the most important black daily in South Africa, and with a daily circulation in excess of 130,000 copies, it is one of the largest dailies in the country. According to recent news stories, President Reagan still talks about a continued friendship with South Africa, but has come to place greater emphasis on the need for a better understanding with the emerging African states. The City Club welcomes this opportunity to hear from journalist Percy Kubota about his South Africa. Mr. Kubota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your kind remarks. When I first came into this room and watched at this distinguished audience here, I was worried about the pictures that may be taken of me speaking to you here. And I'm gratified that you've got the little sign in front of the speaker's rostrum to say that this is a Cleveland club. Otherwise, a caption might have gone back to my homeland saying that I was addressing a Republican Party fundraiser. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there's considerable interest in many parts of the globe today about what is happening in South Africa. And all kinds of people and concerned citizens of the world are talking about what will happen to South Africa. No man who realizes the great problems that nation faces today can sit down and remain aloof as to the dire consequences that may overtake the people of that country unless we find political solutions that, it, that will make it possible for black and white to find each other in that country. But even more serious for the international community, South Africa's strategic mineral resources, strategic sea routes, in the event of a racial confrontation overtaking us, we would make it possible to attract one or the other of the superpowers to intervene on that part of the continent militarily. And, and that when that happens, we face a real danger of a global conflict overtaking us there. For the last 25 years, black political leaders in my community have been warning at home, and they have used all types of platforms like the United Nations to continue to warn the human race that South Africa's racial policies pose one of the greatest dangers to international peace. 
Only now are we beginning to take note of that warning. Is it possible indeed for a nation like that to endanger all of our securities at this time and stage where dangerous weapons are going around which may annihilate all of us from the face of the world? For the last few weeks and months I have been around here, I have had so many people, some of them good intention people, who have been saying to me that we are so glad that your country is changing its racial policies, that apartheid is being eliminated from the face of the earth, and that therefore black and white can find each other in a new spirit of reconciliation. In fact, this delusion started only about two years ago when the then Minister of Black Affairs, Dr. Pete Koronoff, said at a very influential platform in Washington that apartheid, as far as his government was concerned, is dead. I responded, I remember, to the message when I got it in my office that afternoon, that if apartheid is dead, as the government is telling the outside world, then we need to take urgent steps to put up a funeral as soon as possible, because the smell from that body is causing us serious political hazards. I do not believe that those people who say to me that apartheid is changing, realize just how far the South African government has been successful in creating this illusion that they are moving away from their present racial policies and finding political accommodation with their present fellow men. Racial discrimination, it is true, has been eased in many areas. Blacks can now go in exclusively expensive white hotels. Black and white can play soccer games together in the same field. Blacks, unlike 10 years ago, can now go into the boxing ring and pick their strengths and their talents with white boxes. This is true. Some of these things have happened. Now, I'd like to suggest to all of those people who say apartheid is changing that my main preoccupation in life is not to play football anywhere. And eating in a five-star hotel has never been my greatest ambition. And going to a boxing ring and pitting my wits and talents against a white boxer has never been one of my preoccupations. And therefore, black people in South Africa are not talking about this peripheral window dressing activities. They are talking for signs that can show deep in their hearts that there is hope that their fellow white men are beginning to realize the dangers of maintaining the positions of privilege both economically and politically and are talking seriously about power sharing about equal opportunities for all of their citizens. In other words, they are talking about real fundamental changes that will be able to recreate the atmosphere in my land and remove all of those tensions and pressures that are threatening to blow us out from the face of the earth. Recently, there has been much talk in this present administration about South Africa. Even as I'm speaking you, to you today, South Africa's foreign minister, Mr. Pickwater, had a long meeting yesterday with State Secretary Alexander Haig. And just this morning when I left Washington, I was told from reliable sources, and they are most reliable. You do not work for the Washington Star and not have reliable sources. 
was that the minister was going to have a further round of talks, but this time with the President of the United States. This is beginning to crystallize the rhetoric we had during the election campaign. It's beginning to emphasize and underline some of the strong uncoordinated actions and, and, and words from various sources in the administration which seem to indicate that there was a strong tilt towards friendship with South Africa. I do not wish for my homeland enemies around the world. I think it's a good thing that we have friends around the world. But that friendship must be based on the morality and the realization that South Africa needs help to get out of the perilous political policies they have chosen for themselves and not the friendship that would seem to be encouraging them to do the things that they are doing at the moment. And I am told by many well-meaning people again that it's very important for the United States to maintain a presence in Africa in general and in South Africa in particular to act as a deterrent to the Soviet Union. In fact, South Africa has been described by some very highly placed people in this country as the last bastion of defense against Soviet expansionism in Africa. Now, if this view is held by a lot of people, then we are not even beginning to understand what makes Africa tick. For indeed, one of the biggest public relations officers for Soviet policies in Africa is South Africa. If I was a strategist in Moscow, I would fight to maintain the, so the present South African government to remain in power. As long as South Africa pursues those policies, then the neighboring countries, the neighboring territories, and Africa as a whole will continue feeling threatened by the military might of South Africa. And as long as that insecurity exists, the longer the Cubans will remain on our continent. And as long as that insecurity persists, the more African people and African nations will tend to the Soviet Union for more help and for more friendship, since the United States has been perceived throughout the history of colonial fights in Africa as being in support of colonial powers. Today, a lot of us are running around in a state because of the presence of the Cubans in Africa. Have we honestly sat down and asked ourselves why those Cubans are there and why they came there in the first instance? I can only gladly say to you that take heart because American installations in Angola are being guarded by the Cubans. I'd like to say to you that it was precisely because of a, the indecisiveness of the foreign policies of the West that the Cubans got into Africa. When the people of Angola and Mozambique were fighting a war of liberation, the West did not raise a finger to assist them or to encourage them. Even the president I most had the biggest respect and love for, and I still love him, John Kennedy, who in his own inaugural address gave us a commitment in Africa, and in his own words, and I quote him, and to those people in the villages and towns of Africa who are fighting against the colonial yoke, we offer not promises but a commitment to assist them to help themselves against those colonial powers. And yet his own administration put millions and millions of dollars into the pockets of the Portuguese, again in exchange for what people are obsessed here as strategic military installations 
the Azores basis, and that money assisted the Portuguese to continue the agony and the tragedy of Angola and Mozambique. And the people of those countries then turned to the East and to any friendly country to assist them in the war against the Portuguese, who were also very senior members of NATO. And this story is repeated again and again. These diplomatic mistakes are, are repeated again and again. And we are the last to complain about Soviet expansionism because we have thrown aside those values, those great moral values that made America the great nation she became. It is the abandonment of these values that are threatening the greatness of America. I never thought I would live to see the day that an American administration as custodians of your democracy, your value for human life and dignity around the world, would take decisions that would make you militarily support murderous regimes in El Salvador. I never thought I would live to hear an officer of this great nation with a straight face casting aspersions on four of God's children who had offered their time in El Salvador, those nuns, and saying to this nation, oh yeah, they were killed, that they were not exactly nuns, they were involved in something else. Have we come to a stage where America can justify the death of a person simply because that person is involved in something else? This nation has a history of tolerance and the diversities of its people. I am told we cannot import those moralities abroad. If that is so, then our confidence as a nation is highly questionable. And I believe that there is a great opportunity for this nation to play a very critical role even at this late hour, and we are approaching high noon in South Africa, to use your diplomatic leverage, to use your economic might, to pressurize the South African government, not dictate to them what types of political policies they must follow but pressurize them to the conference table where with their fellow men they must sit down, black and white, and together formulate a political and national strategy that would make them live together as brothers, as Martin Luther King once observed, or perish together as fools. I do not underestimate at all the intensity and the damage violence can have in that country. I have spent all of my life to try and avoid that conflict and confrontation. I still believe in a non-violent approach to that problem. Yet I and all of those people in my generation who still believe in this non-violent approach to the problem are becoming an extinct species. We are becoming an endangered species as younger and more impatient people are, are standing up for the things they believe in. They are prepared to die for the things they believe in. So many of our young people, young boys and young girls, have left the country in the last five years, in their hundreds and in their thousands, undergoing military training in various parts of the country, coming back as trained guerrilla fighters. They are blowing up things. And at the moment, we can only thank Almighty God that they are blowing up installations. But soon, soon, unless we do something about it, a seven-year-old white child will be blown to pieces, then we will be outraged. And in retaliation, a seven-year-old black baby will be blown up to pieces. 
and we will be outraged. And when that day dawns on that country, then we would have been in the last lap of the revolution, and there would be very little anybody within that country or out of that country can do to contain that tragedy from overflowing across the borders of our country. And therefore, our concerns, not only as Americans, but your concerns as members of the human race, I do understand the serious problems that you have. I know you've gone through a, a history of this type of racial problem. I know you've gone through those great ideas and the great dream of the 1960s, which is beginning to become a horror of the 80s. I know you are preoccupied with your own positions. But I'd like to say, using your experience, using the vibes and the brains in your heads and the hearts in your bodies, you clearly must understand that it is in the interest of the United States that that question of racism in South Africa is settled as peacefully and amicably for all those people. For make no mistake about it, a violent racial confrontation in, in South Africa will have a serious impact on America. Already, I see signs of these affinities developing where black Americans are beginning to feel very strongly about the situation of black South Africans. And these attitudes are beginning to harden. And therefore, what happens in South Africa at the end will have a very, very serious impact on what happens in the United States and the whole world over. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Proboza. Today at the City Club, we are listening to Percy Kubota, editor of the Johannesburg Post in South Africa. In just a moment, we'll turn to our traditional question period, but first, some announcements. I would be negligent in my responsibilities as chairman of the membership committee to inform you about the progress of our great campaign. You're well aware that April and May are campaign months, and I'm pleased to announce today that our new membership total is 230 new members since the beginning of the campaign, April 1. I shall also remind you that at last Friday's forum, um, we set a new goal of 250 members by the end of May, so we still have a few members to get in terms of our overall goal. Those of you who are in the audience who are not members and those who are listening who are not members should be aware of the fact that only during the rest of this month you can join the City Club and be part of a fantastic tradition, and that will only cost you $25, our special inflation-fighting introductory rate to the City Club. So please, there are membership applications around. Please complete those and get them into our offices by the end of this month because as of June 1st, we go back to our regular rates. Thank you. Today, as always, we have students with us from area high schools who are participating in our Living Seminars program, which we sponsor in cooperation with the Cleveland Board of Education and with the support of SOHIO. With us now are students from the following high schools, East, Fairview, Lincoln West, Glenville, Max S. Hayes, Padua, and Valley Forge. Will those students please stand to receive our welcome? Thank you very much. Our students will be meeting with Mr. Koboza with their, for their own seminar at the conclusion of our forum here. Next week, our speaker will be Dr. Lester R. Brown, president of the World Watch Institute in Washington. His topic will be Transition, the worldwide effort to create a sustainable society. Now we're ready for our question period with Mr. Quiboza. We have two microphones, one in the front with Alan Davis and in the back with Ed Rasmussen. Please raise your hand to be recognized for your questions. And uh, Alan, first. Sir. 
Would you describe uh, for us the circumstances of your arrest? And secondly, would you also comment on the recent federal elections in South Africa and their implications? Um, I'm not quite sure what the circumstances surrounding my arrest were. Um, as you heard in 75-76, I spent a year at Harvard as a Neiman Fellow. I got back to South Africa on the 4th of June in 76, and it was a Friday, and that weekend I met a lot of relatives, friends, neighbors. It was clear to me that there was something very wrong with South Africa at that time. The atmosphere was very, very tense, and there had been a problem affecting the students who were feeling very, very angry about a certain government directive that ordered them to study certain subjects in Afrikaans. And Afrikaans is the language of the ruling party, the government party, and they, they felt this was really pushing down government ideology down their throats. Now, the problem started long before I left for Harvard, and when I came back, it really was still there because the government was adamant that they wouldn't do a thing about it. And that Monday, I began to hear very hair-raising stories about the level of the anger. And the Tuesday, I took a plane into Cape Town where Parliament was meeting. I spoke with a minister responsible for the directive, responsible for black education. And I said to him, look, the position is getting out of hand and dangerous and you've got to respond quite positively. I'm not even saying to you that you must withdraw your, your, your directive. I'm saying to you, suspend it until you can have time to talk to black teachers who were also angry about the directive and talk to the parents who were also becoming angry about the directive. And the man's response to me was, if we pay for your people's education, then surely we have got the right to decide what and how they are taught. And in desperation that afternoon, I went to the Prime Minister through the influence and, and contacts of, of liberal members of the South African Parliament. Uh, they forced him to listen to my plea. And after listening to me, he said to me, well, if there is trouble there, then I'm terribly sorry to hear about it, but I must assure you that law and order will be maintained at all costs. And within seven days, Soweto blew up and rest around the country that left in their aftermath more than 700 people who were killed by police bullets. And we were going through a very traumatic, tense period. And at the forefront of the problem was the fact that most of the newspapers and television crews foreign correspondents couldn't get in to the black ghettos where the trouble was brewing because, first of all, the reporters and the, and, 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 and the television crews were white and, 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 and whites were kept out of there because for their own safety. But they couldn't keep us out of there because we were part of that community. I had to sleep somewhere and so it was my home. And so that the international community began to see what was happening there uh, through our own reporters and through our own reports in the newspaper. And we tried to be as objective and as truthful as we could. And it was to our advantage that we maintained those high standards of integrity. The government did not like it. Some sections of the South African population did not like it. And in September, they wiped out seven of my colleagues who were on duty in a riot situation, they were arrested, reporters and photographers, and they were kept in jail, some of them for two months, some of them for three months, some of them for a year, some of them for two years, without charges against them, without any specific reasons given for their incarceration. 
and we did the best we can with the ones that were remaining. And one after another, we began to vanish from the face of the earth. My turn came for the first time on the 14th of December, 1976. At 2 o'clock in the morning, I was taken from my house, taken to security police headquarters, kept standing there for 11 hours while they interrogated me about the whereabouts of a student leader. And I said to them, listen, go and ask his mother where he is. They said his mother doesn't know. I said, well, if his mother doesn't know, how am I expected to know? They said, well, you run interviews and stories in your paper about him. I said, that's the difference. I don't know where to find him. He knows where to find us. And for 11 hours, I was kept standing there to answer that idiotic sort of question. And after massive protests, a lot of them coming from the U.S., I was released. That was the end of 76. The problem continued in 77. However, on a very mild uh, form, and it seemed to have been working itself out. Until in September the 15th, when Steve Biko, the black consciousness leader, was killed in prison. Then the black community was outraged again. Uh, four days later, on the 19th of September, my house was bombed by men or people unknown. Uh, my children, my twin girls, who were at that time only about six years old, barely escaped serious injury and possible death because the bomb exploded just in a room outside where they were sleeping. And exactly a month later, uh, at two o'clock in the morning, I was phoned in my house to tell me that the Minister of Justice has banned the world and weakened world. And that therefore, as editor, I had the responsibility of waking up even as they were speaking to me and go and get the copies we have printed already at 2 a.m. and make sure that they don't appear in the street because that would be a violation of the Internal Security Act under which they were banned. I said to the police officer who carried this good tidings that with all the good intentions under the sun, there is no way I am going to have to retrieve 176 copies of the newspaper that started going all over the country at 7 o'clock the night before with very fast vents. So even if you give me the helicopters, I would not be able to do it, and I do not have the helicopter. And the fastest thing I have in my house at the moment was a bicycle, and I have no intentions of doing it on my bike. And I immediately went to the office, and we spent with about seven, eight lawyers who were looking into the uh, the ramifications of, of the banning of the papers and trying to find out if uh, the, the, the government's uh, directive can be challenged in court. And of course, as you know, nine lawyers gave us five, nine different versions of, 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 of uh, the only thing they were unanimous about was that we had no leg to stand on. And after drinking gallons and gallons of coffee, and of course, Daybreak came, reporters began to come in, reports began filtering in that so-and-so has been detained, so-and-so has been detained, and by 10 o'clock in the morning, it was quite clear that most of the black leadership all over the country had been wiped out from the face of the earth and taken to jail in a well-orchestrated raid, and at 11 o'clock, the international media was beginning to, 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 to descend on, on the world to come and find out what happened, how it was banned, and the local media began. And at 12.30, they came for me. They simply said, let's go. I said, where to? They said, to Jay. I said, no, I'm not going to Jay. They said, yes, you are. And they produced a warrant, which was signed by the minister, saying that I am being incarcerated under Section 10 of the Internal Security Act. Now, this law 
does not accuse you of any specific crime. It doesn't say you're a criminal. It simply says, if in his opinion, the Minister of Justice has got cause to believe that your physical presence in any community is not conducive to the maintenance of law and order, he may at his discretion remove you from that community and that area and keep you in a place of safe custody until such time that he satisfied the position has gone back to normal. No judge, no court, no archbishop, and the Holy Father himself would intervene in that area. You're gone and nobody can do anything about it. And that's what's happened to me. Those are the circumstances. I, I still don't know why they did it. Uh, they are not saying. Mr. Kabosa, I'd like to ask you about a dilemma that our, our government frequently finds itself in. Take El Salvador, for example. There's a confrontation there between a repressive government and the people. We've chosen to support, by delivery of arms, this government. But had we chosen the other, the other uh, leg of the uh, of, of our uh, of our choice choices, uh, we would have found ourselves supporting a group that's backed by the Soviet Union and is receiving directly or indirectly help from the Soviet Union. Uh, how, would, how do you suggest we resolve that type of a dilemma? First. I think you are going to have to liberate yourself from the obsession of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union is of no consequence at all, and the Soviet Union can be neutralized as, you know, as easy as anything. I do not believe that your responsibility is to take sides in El Salvador. Your responsibility is to bring about peace amongst the people there. Now, I have seen no moves yet to bring either side to the conference table. I've seen moves that gives the other side guns to do its thing against the other side. Now, if people say to me, but the Soviet Union is a reality even in Africa. Look at what they are doing. Listen, communism, Marxism cannot lie side by side with African culture. And do not mistake people using their resources to fight their liberation war as an endorsement of their philosophies. And a typical example of this obsession about the Soviet Union was the fact that this country was not prepared for a Robert Mugabe's victory in Zimbabwe. My great friend and patron saint, Jesse Helms, taught Bishop Muzarewa and Ian Smith were nice guys, and that America must put its resources in helping them overcome what the press and the radio and television in this country called the Marxist Soviet backed terrorist leader. It so happened that Jesse Helms' own sentiments about what should happen to the people of Zimbabwe and Zimbabwe had absolutely nothing to do with what the majority of the people in that country perceive to be the good thing for themselves. Now, of course, I do agree that Robert Mugabe is no more the Marxist terrorist leader who kills children and, and, and women in, in, in Zimbabwe. He has been canonized. He's more like a saint these days in Washington. He's a hell of a nice guy. Even the president, significantly enough, when he was lying on his bed in Georgetown University, wrote two letters to the leaders of, the, of both houses, commending Robert Mugabe and his efforts to bring about reconciliation and economic stability in that country. 
Now, Ian Smith and Robert Mugabe, who were against the Soviet back, Marxist uh, Mugabe, um, are nowhere. They've gone into oblivion. In fact, the bishop is doing what he knows best, and that is preaching the Holy Scriptures. And Ian Smith, well, history is about to write him off. So that here was a classical example where these guys had to say to the Soviet Union or anybody for that matter, give us the resources to fight a war. And I am saying to you that use all your resources, and my God, you've got the resources, to bring a halt to the fighting in El Salvador and try and use your influence on both sides to bring them together, to, to let them talk things together. But don't supply guns at the expense of the other. You are not neutralizing the Soviet Union. You are increasing the sufferings of the people there. Uh, my wife and I re recently returned from a trip to South Africa, and we perceived a considerable difference in a, of opinion and attitude uh, between the Afrikaner and the so-called English-speaking white, particularly among the young. I wonder if our perception was an accurate one, and uh, if so, or even if not, if you would comment on that. Oh, yeah, it's true. Listen, I am not saying that all Africaners are bad. In the same way as I am saying to you, I do not think all blacks are good. There are good Africaners, there are bad Africaners, there are bad blacks, there are good blacks. But all I'm saying is, um, even within the Africanos, you find some very good liberal oriented Africanos. The leader of the official opposition in South Africa, Dr. Ponsel Slabot, a very active and very creative uh, person who I have the highest regard and respect for, is from a very eminent Africana home. Uh, the Jewish community, the English-speaking communities, have all had a very long history of opposing government policies. And, and, and therefore, you know, it's, it's not a question, a clear-cut question of black against white. Uh, uh, that's that's a, general, a generalization. Uh, there's not even consensus amongst the blacks about many of the details. We disagree about many of the details. There's only one thing we are in unanimity, and that is we want to be free. And after we are free, then the party will begin. I'm curious as whether there is anything resembling the First Amendment in South Africa. and. If there isn't, which I believe there probably isn't, your role in disseminating news among the black people in that country and creating a quasi-First Amendment, if, there, if you can have that, such a thing in South Africa. Yes. Uh, no, we haven't got a First Amendment at all. Uh, we won't have for a considerable time to come. Uh, and therefore freedom of thought, freedom of expression, and the freedom of newspapers to do the things that they have to do is purely dependent on the mercy of the government. Now, it's the black newspapers have been singled out uh, for this type of treatment for the simple reason I believe that the government is terribly scared of they are audience, and therefore they would try to suppress as effectively as they can information reaching the black community. And the South African government is spending millions and millions of dollars to try and counter counteract the role of the press in disseminating information. For example, 
They've got radio stations which they pay for um, and control, and they control the country's TV. Um, so when Prime Minister Bota talks about the battle being on for the hearts and the minds of the people, he literally means we are going to spend a lot of the country's resources supporting um, the indoctrination or misinformation of people. So, uh, you know, the First Amendment, as you have in this country, is not there. In fact, sometimes when I sit and see the beautiful freedoms that your newspapers have and the inability of the average American to be appreciative of that freedom, then I really get discouraged. Because freedom is something you need not take for granted. The moment you do that, watch over your sh shoulder, Richard Nixon may be... <laughs> do you believe you will be able to return to your country and uh, resume the editorship of the newspaper? after being here in the United States and making speeches such as we've heard today? Um, I will return to my country, but as to resuming the editorship, unfortunately, I have no newspaper anymore to edit. Uh, when the chairman introduced me earlier and he talked about the Post and Sunday Post, um, having replaced the world and weekend world, uh, I think he did not realize that both the Post and Sunday Post also suffered the same fate in January this year. Uh, this August, I'll be taking some American journalists and professors to Southern Africa we're going to be going to Mozambique, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. There's some discussion of whether we should try to go to Southern Africa, given the fact that some people say that Americans should boycott that area. First of all, do you think we should go to South Africa? And second of all, if we're a group of both black and white Americans, can we get into South Africa? Um. I think it's commendable that you go to those countries in Southern Africa. But I think there's also a, a very important uh, a responsibility here as press people. And that is to be able to explain to your readership and constituencies here what is it South Africa is all about? And if you stay out of there, you won't know what is happening. I know there is a lot of talk about a boycott in South Africa, don't go to South Africa, and so on. I can understand the motivations and so on. But the total keeping aloof from that country means at the same time that you deprive your, your, yourself of the knowledge to know. And the right to know is a very important right for your readers to be able to judge for themselves what really is happening. Otherwise, we make very, very patent mistakes uh, because we don't understand and we are ignorant of the real contemporary facts that confront us. And I tell you how, how dangerous this can be. The other day in the celebrated interview with Walter Conrad, the president made a comment that how can we turn our backs on a country that fought side by side with us in two wars? Now, it's true South Africa fought on the side of the allies in the two wars, but what the president did not appreciate, or somebody didn't tell him this, that in the Second World War, if the present rulers of South Africa were in fact ruling in South Africa, 
they would have fought on the side of the Nazis because their party officially endorsed the Nazis. They committed acts of sabotage and treason in the country, trying to stop young South Africans from joining on the side of their allies. In fact, one of them, the prominent ones, who later became Prime Minister John Foster, was incarcerated uh, during the war years for the simple reason that he was supporting the Nazis. Now, I have relatives, a lot of blacks have got relatives, who laid down their lives. My, my, my uncles died in El Alamein. They laid down their lives, I believe, in a quest to defend freedom. And yet, <laughs> we, their, their children, suffer the same types of indignities and discriminations that were enshrined in the Nazi philosophy. And therefore, I don't think the president was being malicious, but I think the president was badly misinformed about contemporary South African history. Those guys were Nazis. It's in the history books. And some of them are still proud of their role there. In fact, one of them had been sent to Germany. He underwent training uh, in sabotage and all types of things. And he was dropped along the South African coast by a Nazi submarine. Fortunately for that country, he was intercepted, tried, sentenced to death. And in 1948, when the present government got into power, his death sentence had already been commuted to life. And when these guys got into power, the present government, their first act when they got into power in 1948 was to release that guy, not as a rehabilitated criminal, but as a hero. So you need to go there, know what's happening, and, and let's inform people. Mr. Caboza, could you give us your um, reactions to some of the implications of the most recent election in South Africa? Yes. Um, it was an election that surprised me um, in two ways. It was sad, but it also gave a ray of hope. It was said that there was a dramatic increase of right-wing politics in South Africa. Um, in the last election, the right-wing radical white parties um, only polled about 35,000 votes. Um, but in this election, their support went up by 12%. But so did significantly. And this was the hope. The, the support for the liberal um, the progressive party, they gained nine new seats. And that was a pleasant surprise. But what, are they, what does it mean? It means the Prime Minister is going to abandon, abandon the face of his reformist policies in the face of this um, increasing right-wingers who are accusing him in any way of doing so much for the blacks. Uh, I don't know what he has done for the blacks. Uh, but, you know, if things run through to form, he will feel terribly inhibited because if there's one thing the African leadership has been very weak in is they do not want to be perceived by history as having been responsible for the division of the African nation. And therefore, I think in an effort to maintain African unity, uh, he is going to go it very, very slow. Sir, uh, we hear uh, once in a while about a man named Joseph Savimbi, uh, who seems to have a role in Angola and also in Southwest Africa. Tell us about him. 
John of Savindi is a very impressive man. When you meet him, he really looks impressive, very elegant, very articulate, and so on. But John of Savindi also happens to be a political bandit who started off his political career by being terribly anti-American and so on. And uh, he then took his opportunities when he found them and so on. And in his own country, he is of no consequence to, to anybody. He's very important to Jesse Helms at the moment, but then Jesse Helms has got a beautiful track record. And the CIA love him very much. I don't know if you saw there were some planes that were intercepted, and everybody's keeping quiet about it at the moment, but my reliable sources, and I told you I have reliable sources, tell me, of course, that they were destined for Namibia and South Africa. Um, to support Sabindi is to support the wrong horse again, and by God, haven't this nation had such a tragic history of supporting wrong causes and wrong horses? Can't we for the first time do the right thing and support what is the people's choice? And the people's choice in Angola is the MPLA. And Savimbi will keep on coming to Washington. Part of the tax cuts uh, will go to him. Enjoys himself. We've got only one minute left. Uh, can you name a, a country in South Africa that gives, uh, or in, in Africa, that gives First Amendment rights? Any country? Nigeria, Kenya, slightly. No, what we need to address ourselves to is, I am in fact concerned about the question of the press, in South, in, in, not in South Africa, in Africa, in developing countries. Until such time that presses and, and newspapers can be in the hands of private individuals, then we can forget about free press, because governments uh, are the only ones who have the money to establish them, and therefore... Um, I, I hate presses that are, 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 are controlled by the government, whether they are black or white. But until such time that we have economic viability where people can develop like any country, uh, I'm afraid the First Amendment is a little bit of a paradise dream. Thank you very much, Mr. Koboza. Today at the City Club, we've been listening to Percy Koboda, distinguished journalist from South Africa. City Club Forum is now adjourned.